for coming uh, to this first uh, what we hope will be an annual commemoration of the enslaved human beings who were sold by our board of trustees so that Wake Forest would have its first endowment. This fact was discovered by five of my students in less than three weeks worth of work in a course that they signed up for in the second half of the semester that wasn't even directly on the topic of slavery, but instead was looking at the Holocaust and at the Civil War memorials and collective memories about those events. We were stunned and appalled by these findings. It was news to me that we had sold human beings for the sake of our bank account. Wake Forest owes a debt it can never repay, but this is one step in the direction of attempting to teach the truth about this. 
Now, I see a good number of my students here, and I appreciate that this is sort of a scary thing to do. But if anyone would care to say something from the class, I would turn it over to you before the next speaker. Chavis, uh, associate provost, and a member of the law faculty. Several years ago, the provost office convened a group of students, faculty, staff to examine Wake Forest's history. This group was particularly focused on uh, correcting some historical inaccuracies and acknowledging the university's uh, dealings with slavery and its legacies. Since that time, Wake Forest has joined a consortium, uh, consortium called the University Studying Slavery, which is a group of universities, other universities, examining their own history with slavery. On our campus, we have referred to that work as the histories of Wake Forest. Today, it is proper and fitting as we will remember the 14 uh, people that uh, J uh, Professor Suarez has uh, spoken about, these 14 souls. Uh, that I will tell you uh, a bit about the plans underway to expand this work of the histories of Wake Forest. The new working title for this work will be called the Slavery, Race, and Memory Project. The Slavery, Race, and Memory Project will focus on revealing an accurate history of Wake Forest that begins with the original campus and its relationship to slavery. Uh, the project will also focus on Wake Forest during the Jim Crow era and um, of racial segregation uh, all the way through the present day. This project is a scholarly and uh, academic endeavor uh, and the university through the office of the provost has dedicated some resources uh, to faculty and student engagement and programming. In the fall, you will hear more about some of the opportunities to become involved uh, in that work, uh, course development, student fa and faculty uh, research projects, and scholarly lectures dedicated to these issues. Um, it's my hope that, uh, that the work done through the Slavery, Race, and Memory Project will be done always with a commitment uh, to the four following principles. For those of you who like acronyms, it's TILT. Truth, Integrity, Legitimacy, and Transparency. It's only uh, when we engage uh, in this work through these principles that we can truly honor the stories of the 14 individuals you're going to hear about and the stories yet to be told. We do have uh, Nisi Myers from my class who will say a few words before we proceed to the statement and then the reading of the names because it was it was both the shock of discovering this fact, but also being able to identify the individuals involved. Hello, I'm Nisi Myers. I suppose you kind of kindly introduce me. Um, forgive me, I don't like speaking on my phone, but I already have time to print, so I'm just going to take it here. Um, as one of the students of Dr. Soda's Collective Memory and Social Conflict course, I've seen firsthand that you can indeed discover the truth if the truth is indeed what you are looking for. If you are willing to do the work that will likely and deservingly so, disrupt the comfort of your very history and every sentiment of its aftermath, then you are willing to condemn the very meaning of enslavement and racism, and furthermore, claim accountability when it is in your own backyard. My classmates and I represent a familiar Wake Forest history. As students who are doing the necessary work to uncover and publicize some present truths of our university, as leaders in every movement and small victory, even when we're standing in the midst of a university that isn't as like-minded as we are. The names that we honor and commemorate today have always been our Wake Forest history. The foundation of enslavement is solely and deeply rooted in racism, and we know that racism lives in the fabric of this university. When I think of these names and the children that accompany them, I think of the innocents that live within each of them as victims of moral criminality. And when we say their names today, I hope we know how perverse it is to only know who they are now, but how critically sacred and valuable it is to now have them, and that we save them on this day, 159 years later, on the steps of Wake Chapel. I'd like to thank each and every individual who not only made today possible, but just as critically made the groundwork of this day very possible. 
to every faculty, staff, student, and beyond who desires to do the work, who is willing to go there, thank you. We are far from finished. My hope is that this often isolated work will become a much more communal and prevailing effort. And I leave our community with words from the late Audre Lorde. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Thank you. On May 7, 1860, 159 years ago today, 14 enslaved individuals were sold at auction in fulfillment of the will of John Blount in order to create a fund to support the education of Baptist ministers at the Wake Forest Institute, the earliest incarnation of Wake Forest University. The sale of these enslaved people was coordinated by James Purefoy, the treasurer of the Board of Trustees. The information we share today is news to many of us, even though it was not unknown. It was published in volume one of Pascal's History of Wake Forest in 1935. It appears in Craig Wilder's book, Ebony and Ivy, Slavery and the Troubled History of America's Universities, published in 2013. The information also appears on the ZSR Library digital timeline. It was rediscovered and brought to our attention by Wake Forest students in a sociology seminar on collective memory this semester. Today is the first time to our knowledge that we gather as members of a university community to remember and speak the names of the enslaved individuals whose lives were traded for the financial gain of Wake Forest. The original endowment for Wake Forest rests on a moral crime, the sale of human beings. While it is news to many, it is assurance to some that this is no surprise. And we mark this moment by speaking the names. Some have asked, why is it important to say their names? Names carry sacred memory. And while certainly these were not the names I imagine their forebears came across the transatlantic with, certainly they were the names that those who owned them assigned them to. And so even though we will call those names more than that, we are calling for the memory, the essence, the presence. It is no mistake that Professor Pace and Professor Suarez and others found this. Indeed, in African indigenous traditions and other indigenous traditions, it is the understanding that the ancestors are never dead. That there is a way in which they speak to us and they wake us from our rest and they wrestle with us, and they call us forth until indeed we call their names. And so we stand on this space, and only being able to imagine possibly that they too stood on a wood or cement block, much shaped like these steps, an auction block while others looked at them, prodding at them, lifting up their hands, lifting up parts of their bodies, trying to see whether or not how much they were worth. And so here we are in this moment, standing, watching, but it is my hope with a different gaze, a gaze that does not look upon their memory as a commodified one a gaze though that acknowledges them as human beings. So I invite you to speak the names after I speak them. And for those who are so willing, after each name we will say Ashe, which one meaning is amen. 159 years later, we acknowledge the humanity and call the name of Isaac, Ashe. We call the name of Jim, Ashe. We call the name of Pompey, Ashe. 
We call the name of Emma. Emma. Oh, we call the name of Nancy. Nancy. Oh, we call the name of Harriet. Harriet. Oh, and we say the name child. child. Oh, because Harriet had a child who was not named. We call the name Joseph. Joseph. Ashe. We call the name Harry. Harry. Ashe. We call the name Anne. Ashe. And we say child. Ashe. And child again. Ashe. Because Anne had two children. And we call the name Thomas. Thomas. Ashe. We call these names. May we not rest. May we not rest well until their memory is seared into the depths of our hearts, into the depths of our soul. May we never forget our history and its founding on black flesh. May we know that we are called into this sacred space for sacred memory to re-hyphen member the pieces of our history back together again. For this is the work that we all must do. Indeed, in the words of Alice Walker and in the words of Katie Cannon, it is the work our souls must have. Listen. They are here. Their spirits, their names, with us. And they call us to find a better way, a new way, a life-giving, freedom-finding, justice-making way. Listen. We hear you. 
and we have responded. And we invite you to go and do likewise. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe.